I blame my patrons for this. <laughs> for those of you out of the loop, I had a Patreon goal that if I reach 50 supporters over on patreon.com slash mainly Mandy, that I would make a review of the show Polyamory, Married and Dating, which was a reality TV show that first premiered on Showtime back in 2012. You know, like a stupid person. <laughs> the show features three relationship structures or polycules, a quad and a different triad each season. This show is not my favorite, to be honest with you. For starters, the kind of reality TV show that I actually do enjoy to consume tends to either fall in the category of competition shows, like the kind that you actually have to be talented at, think of, you know, Dragula or Chopped, or else fits into wholesome renovations. Think of your Fixer Uppers or Queer Eye. Yes, I watch Queer Eye and I cry sometimes because I am trash. Shows where people fight, unnecessary drama, and just like straight up manipulation tactics are not my cup of tea. And all of that and more is involved very much in polyamory, married and dating. Now, I actually had once watched this show previously back when I was monogamous, actually. At the time, my partner and I were starting to talk about the possibility of us being non-monogamous, and we decided that we would watch this show together just to kind of see what we thought. And we had, many criticisms. Now for this video, I ended up watching both seasons twice with two friends of mine, one of whom is local and for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna call her honey just to like keep her anonymity, as well as with of course my favorite bashing back thembo, Kaylin Conrad. By the way, throughout this video, you're gonna hear a few alternative names to this show that Kaylin kept coming up with while we were watching. They were all very funny, so. Forgive me for stealing their jokes. <laughs> I've never really bothered re-watching this show until now because honestly, I just don't like most of the people on it. And also like their style of non-monogamy is just so not reflective of my own. I'm more of a solo polyamorous slash relationship anarchist. And these people are like extremely enmeshed kitchen table poly, which like, you know, I don't necessarily think that kitchen table poly is bad. I just don't like this level of like being up each other's butts. Like they are just right up there. <laughs> so there's just a lot in this show that just isn't really fun for me to watch. Spoiler alert, these are some of the most hierarchical, self-important people I have ever seen. Well, I'm the queen of poly. But a promise is a promise and I always keep my promises. Oh shit, don't look at that. So let's talk about polyamory, married and dating. The show that makes a lot of non-monogamous people go, really? Look at sexy polyamorous people making out. Okay, so before I actually start talking about the show, just like obligatory caveat. Polyamory, Married and Dating is a reality TV show. Reality TV shows are kind of notorious for not being exactly as much reality as you actually think. Pointing this out now because I want to acknowledge that how I feel is, you know, in part at least, directly affected by editing choices that the producers of this show made. There may be context not available to me, vital information that, if I had had it, might have actually changed some of the conclusions that you are about to hear. Throughout this video, there are going to be times when I am going to get very animated and express some admittedly harsh opinions about some of the people, choices made in this show, and relationship developments as they come up. I vow here and now that I am going to attempt to remember two important things. Number one, the way that I practice non-monogamy is not necessarily the way that everybody does, and that is okay. I personally chose this style of non-monogamy because it works best for me, not because it is inherently the best version. I do think there are certain things that are inherently toxic and some of those things will come up in this video, but I just wanna make it clear that just because these people are not solo polyamorous, they are not inherently bad for that reason. Number two, this show did air a decade ago. In fact, this year was the 10 year anniversary of it. These people have, you know, whole new lives. Many of them have moved on onto other things. I don't even know if all of them are polyamorous anymore. And, you know, certainly there are things that I said and did like a decade ago that I would probably be like really embarrassed by. So, you know, just because they said these things back then, it doesn't mean that they necessarily stand by them now. The other thing that I wanna say is that I am incapable of covering every single plot point and development that happens in the show. So just be aware that I am inevitably going to miss some things. 
to be honest with you, I have been, been dealing with some depression stuff lately and a lot of other stuff. So like what you see in this video is the amount of energy I have to cover things. Also, to be honest with you, I just, there's just certain things I didn't really want to talk about or that weren't that interesting to me. Like, I'm sorry, I don't really care about the fact that Tal and that one guy ended up in a hot tub together. Like, ooh, big deal. Men making out with men. That sounds like a Thursday to me. <laughs> Thursdays are when the gays get in hot tubs. <laughs> is that a stereotype? Did I just make a new gay stereotype? I might've just made a new gay stereotype. I realize this is a lot of preamble for a reality TV show that aired a decade ago, but I just wanna make sure I'm covering all my bases. And there is also a chance that those who were involved with the show or uh, somehow connected to those who were involved may stumble upon this video. While the reality of the show is certainly in question and much of the time, these are real people. And you know, I do wanna try and remember that. Okay, so let's jump into this. How do I jump into this? Do 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 do. As I mentioned in the intro, we have two triads in polyamory, Naked and Afraid. The season one triad, Lindsay, Veronica, and Anthony, are like, I think they're like mid to late 20s, maybe early 30s. Um, I get like kind of baby wannabe radical vibes from them. Like Vanessa at one point makes this very like blatant statement about gendered objects. What? And the way that Anthony sort of talks about the relationship at times has that kind of like arrogant polyamorous attitude that we actually talked about in my polyamorous enlightened video. Plus there are some super subtle clues to their political beliefs. Comrade Anthony. In this triad, Lindsay and Anthony are married and have been dating slash living with Vanessa for the past few years. There are a couple of big moments in the season for the triad, but the two kind of big plot points are that number one, Vanessa and Anthony get mad at Lindsay for having another relationship outside the triad that they feel is taking away too much of her attention. And number two, Vanessa decides to propose to Anthony and Lindsay. Of the three, Lindsay is probably the one that I like the most. She's the one that just seems to have like the most solid head on her shoulders. Vanessa and Anthony at times come off like really cringy to me, especially Vanessa, who at times actions just scream jealousy and insecurity. Like not in like an understandable way, but like in a girl, you need some therapy way. I don't want you to send 75 kiss, kiss, love you text messages a day to him. Okay, I want you to send it, them to me. Now you have to keep going. <laughs> I don't feel good yet. Like there were a couple of times in particular, I found myself getting really angry at the way that Vanessa would speak to Lindsay. You coward, you coward. While watching with my friend Honey, she told me she routinely forgot that Vanessa wasn't the wife just because of the levels of entitlement that she was showing, which I think says a lot. Anthony in many ways is just like, kind of there. I mean, he doesn't really do much this season other than like, kind of just waxing poetic about polyamory, going along with Vanessa's bullshit, and also just like enjoying threesomes. Anthony to me very much comes across as like straight guy who happened to look into a triad and now he's spending like every spare moment he can to talk about how inherently toxic monogamy is. I think that human beings are naturally poly and that there's some freaks who are monogamous. Like if you got cornered at a party by this guy for five minutes, he's spending all five of those minutes to tell you why he thinks you should try poly Amory now. Anyway, Lindsay deserves better. The triad in season two, Leanne, Megan, and Chris is a bit of an older triad. I say a bit because there's a kind of some weird age gaps happening in this one. Chris, the man in the relationship is like 45, his wife Leanne is 32, and their living girlfriend Megan is 24. And I started dating her when she was 21. So right off the bat, the season two triad is, um, very problematic for me. The season two triads arc is mostly concerned on the fact that Leanne is spending a lot less time at home with her partners due to having a much busier schedule than the both of them. And she's worried very specifically about how this is affecting her relationship with Chris. Well, I can't know this for certain. I get the sense that Chris and Leanne were kind of like unicorn hunters and this relationship with Megan just developed a lot faster than any of them expected. Like it doesn't really seem like they've had much in the way of conversations or discussions about like what's been happening with them. In fact, this is something that they admit within the show itself. When we started, we kind of just loved each other, so we all got together and we figured, oh, we'll figure it out later how it's gonna work. You know, now it's three years and we still never really like talk about how it works, how it works. Which is like a pretty big red flag. 
Also, a really big development that comes out later in the season is that it turns out some of these business trips that Leanne was on were actually her cheating on them with another man outside of the triad. It's a whole thing, we'll get to that later. The Quad's arc, which we see in both seasons, initially starts off when Jen and Tall, a married couple, move in with their partners, Kamala and Michael, who are also a married couple. Basically, in this Quad, everyone is dating everyone else, except for Michael and Tall, because Michael is straight. By the way, since the show aired, Kamala Devi has come out as non-binary and uses they, them pronouns, which I will be using throughout this review. Some of the clips that you may see in this video may include some of those old out-of-date pronouns that so I just wanted to give you a heads up about that. Members of the quad are allowed to have relationships outside of it, and I believe all of them do in fact, but it is still a very enmeshed version of polyamory. The quad is often updating each other about how relationships are developing or, you know, showing a lot of interest in each other's like sex lives, sharing lots of details of that stuff, by the way. Always fun to catch up, see what people have been up to and who's done what and who. It is also a very high school version of polyamory with Kamala and Michael kind of acting as the leaders and sort of like dictating and making the decisions for everybody else. So like season one is like the move and like acclimating to like the adjustment of like living with each other and, and all of that. There's some other things that happen too. Like there's this whole thing where Michael gets really mad that Kamala won't share their girlfriend with him and it's, it's just, awkward and bad. She has excluded me from dating Roxanne, and that's really not okay. I gotta tell you, Michael really reminds me of just like a particular brood of polyamorous male that unfortunately is very much a part of our community, and um, I just, I'm not a fan. <laughs> really my whole attitude about this show. Just not, a, just not a fan, just not a fan. And then there's Tall. Monogamy destroys families. <laughs> Oh, very much has this whole kind of like, you know, oh, I'm just like cool and chill, like this like outer shell that he like shows to everybody. But in reality, Tall does a lot of shit that I really don't think is okay. It's really frustrating. And I'm especially annoyed at the way that he at times helps Kamala and Michael just like outright manipulate and dogpile Jen, you know, his wife. <laughs> Tall is also the one who says my least favorite thing in both seasons of this show. Polyamory is an evolved way of thinking. Oh. Season two has a lot more drama for the quad. Uh, for example, Jen starts dating a younger man named Jesse who is very new to non-monogamy and Michael starts dating a woman who he's hoping to have a much deeper relationship with. Season two also has Tall coming out as bisexual. So we actually get to have some queer guy action. So. Yay? Oh yeah, that's actually something we should probably talk a little bit more about. Um, this show has a lot of saxophone playing in it. Do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. So in polyamory, I was pregnant and didn't know it, there is a lot of sex on screen. Like literally every episode has at least one sex scene, usually multiple. And we are talking like full frontal nudity too. which obviously I can't show you, but I promise it's a thing. We get threesomes, we get people forking in their backyard, shower sex, and in season two, Kink enters the chat. And generally speaking, sex or people being sexual doesn't really bother me, but a criticism of this show that I do think is valid is that at times it feels just like really gratuitous and unnecessary. It feels sensationalized. It also comes off very male gazy, which is to say that there's a lot of focus of the women in these various <laughs> configurations and situations. And they're always like arching their back and they're sweaty and they're moaning and posing and it's it's just a lot. Queer women's sexuality being seen as like sexy and commodified isn't a new thing. I mean this has been going on since like what the 90s. So this isn't like surprising to me at all but it is frustrating. The thing that came out of the situation is that Jen and Sephora had this little bonding moment and I was like ah yes. One step closer to threesome. <laughs> because the show is very much reinforcing the idea that like 
between women or, you know, and AFAB individuals, because again, Kamala has since come out as non-binary, is just like inherently like really hot, you know? It does that thing where it's like, ooh, look at these women that are like making out and their boobies are putting together, ooh. They're just boobies, like just, just calm down. And we don't really get the equivalent of that until season two when Tall is pursuing Michael's brother. Yes, his roommate's brother. The brother of the man who until very recently was his wife. These people are the polyamorous Lannisters. <laughs> Another issue with the focus on the sex is that the show is kind of presenting it as being essentially the norm for polyamorous relationships, which isn't true. Hell, even for people who are highly sexual, group sex isn't always something that they're interested in. And yet that's kind of the main focus of the sex in the show. Personally have some doubts about how realistic the sex is actually being portrayed in the show, to be honest with you. Like twice in season two, people are like walked in on in the middle of sexual acts and it comes off a little bit like poorly acted. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> hey, babe. It's gonna feel good to get a shower. Yeah, yeah, it's a long trip, huh? Yeah, take our shoes off? Yeah, yeah, take our shoes off when you guys have. Hey. Do you think it's a bit shitty of the show to never, like, take a moment to pause and say, hey, you know, just as a FYI, this isn't how all polyamorous people do. It isn't all bad, you know, I won't lie. I think there were a couple of moments that were kind of hot, I'll admit. And there were a couple of times in which a, like, need was being expressed during sex that was, like, accepted really immediately. And I did find that, like, really wholesome. I honestly think that's great that the show occasionally had threesomes needed to, you know, have to have a pause or something because somebody realized they needed to, like, change their mind during sex. And I think that's actually like a really great thing to demonstrate to your audience to show that, yeah, you know, people sometimes change their minds. Sometimes their mood changes. Maybe they're just not quite feeling it and showing that just being accepted by everyone. Like I, I do find that like really wholesome and like, and then they would still get cuddles afterwards. Like that's, that is cute. Like that, that I will give you that show. It's just weird to juxtapose that with the show's ending, which was an orgy. No, literally, season two ends in a giant orgy. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I know this is a little bit of a probably unpopular opinion, but I think it's probably good the show ended after two seasons because like, how would they have topped that? Like how? A bigger orgy? <laughs> a more orgy orgy? Do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. The way season one Jen is treated is absolutely abhorrent. Pretty much any time there's some kind of conflict in the quad in season one, it's usually centered on Jen or something to do with her. Like there's kind of this attitude that Jen isn't as like actually free and uninhibited as the rest. Like she doesn't have as high of a drive. I love Jennifer, but Jen doesn't have that big a drive. And so she can't really meet all my demands. I do not have as much of a drive as Kamala, Michael and Tall. Penetration is a big deal for me. I don't know why, that's just how I'm built. Jen is also at times presented as if she's a lot more insecure and still has a lot more work to do in order to be truly poly. Jen and Tall really have to work to make Polly work for them. I look at Tall as ready to go, wanting to love, go deeper, faster. Whereas Jen, she's not quite as ready. Like even her own husband talks about her in this way where it just feels like he's just barely containing the eye rolls at this point. I'm totally laid back. Um, there's not too many things that bother me. But at the same time, sometimes it gets a little too much where I just have to be like, Jen, you know, just does everything have to be your way? When I was watching with both Kaylin and Honey, my jaw just kept dropping to the floor at the number of times Jen would just communicate a discomfort or a boundary only to be completely ignored, silenced, or manipulated into going along with what they wanted anyway. In episode five of the first season, the quad decides to host a polyamorous potluck and invite a bunch of people over. In fact, the season one triad ends up going to it. It is said within the episode explicitly that this part Party is being thrown in part to help welcome Jen and Tal into the house and make it feel like it's more of their home. Do a combination potluck and housewarming and really make it like a big community welcome for you guys because I think everyone thinks cool. of it as our house mm -hmm. and I want them to know, you know, to think of it as our pod's house. And keep that in mind because that's about to go completely up in smoke in three, two, one. <laughs> the guest that Michael and Kamala invite over is a woman named Sherry, and it becomes very quickly apparent that Jen doesn't want her there. Honestly, I'm not 
I'm not that comfortable with Sherry coming. And the reason that Jen isn't comfortable around her is that Tall apparently did some things with Sherry like a while ago that was like in violation of some of their agreements. I assume sexual things, but like it's never explicitly said. So like, I don't know that for certain. Sherry and Tall used to date and Tall has made mistakes with her. He lied a couple times. And wow, that really does change some of the context we saw before now, doesn't it? And polyamory cheating can still happen. I still sometimes see like conversations about whether or not the term cheating is useful to use in non-monogamy since typically we're talking about relationships where there's like an explicit agreement around people being sexually and or emotionally exclusive. I personally do think that the term can be useful though because at the very least it helps to kind of like make it clear why someone violating a certain agreement can be hurtful and can sometimes change a relationship. The point is in that some way Tall has cheated on Jen so her at times being insecure and concerned about him being mindful of his needs like is her just being completely rational? I mean this isn't coming out of nowhere. It's my house too and you know, I stopped seeing her because you wanted me to stop having sex with her. This is my house as well. And, but you also have to take some responsibility around you know the stupid shit that you did when you were with her and yeah. that is really painful for me every time I see her. When you break someone's trust, it can take a long time to reestablish that and that is just a reasonable consequence of it happening. However, the quad just keeps acting like Jen is somehow being unreasonable to not want this woman in her home. We don't exclude people because there's somebody there that doesn't want them to come. Uh, that's exactly what you do. If you live with other people, you have to have agreements for who will come over and like what you're comfortable with. And sometimes you have to be respectful that your roommate, lover, whatever, is not going to want certain people in their space. Like if I had a roommate who asked me if my ex-fiance could come over, I would say no, because my ex-fiance is also my former abuser and I don't want him anywhere near my home. If that person then said to me, well, we don't exclude people, I would be on Craigslist the next day looking for a new place. Do people still use Craigslist to find roommates? I don't, I don't know. A home isn't a public space. No one has right to be in it other than those who live there. If I run into my ex at say a restaurant or something, I mean, yeah, I'd probably still be upset to be honest with you, but like that's just the nature of the world and being out in public. If I happened, I could always just remove myself from the situation and maybe even go home so I could feel a little bit more safe. But my home? My sacred space where I take off my bra and allow my boobies to be at their most vulnerable? Not happening. Before you live with anyone, you should definitely have agreements about guests and you know talk about, about any strong boundaries about which people are allowed to come over. And that needs to be respected. I've had some people argue that you don't get to do that, especially in non-monogamy. I mostly heard this from relationship anarchists, which I guess I shouldn't be surprised by, but I just really don't agree. I think we're talking about someone's home and it is not unreasonable to have boundaries regarding that. And I think the way everyone treats Jen here is just objectively shitty. The bottom line is what do you need to be comfortable and to make the most of the party even if you don't say anything to her all night. Also and, and this isn't like an important point necessarily but this is like literally the only time we ever really see Sherry in the show like I just I just don't get it like why was it so important to have random polyamorous person number 12 at this party like I just don't like especially at the point of the party is to make Jen feel like this is more of her home like do you do you get it <laughs> do you understand why I'm so upset even worse nobody tells Sherry to just like leave Jen alone and give her a wide burp so when Sherry comes to the party she makes like this beeline to Jen to give her a hug and some flowers and it is just like it is so awkward <laughs> These are for the ladies' house. That's for me. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Sherry arrives to the party and she brings me some flowers. Why don't we put that on the mantle? It made me uncomfortable. Oh my god, why are you people like this? Like, at least tell Sherry to just leave Jen alone. Like, oh my god, Kamala, I know you know how to tell people what to do because you do it all the f time. I'm the queen of Polly. Luckily, nothing really comes of it, but I just really hate seeing the way a totally, completely reasonable boundary is presented like Jen is just this like insecure, crazy person. Typically in a monogamous breakup, couples stop talking and sometimes they don't even see each other. But in polyamory, we don't even call it breakup. We call it transition. Jen needs to learn how to transition into friendship with Sherry. Oh, by the way, this same episode features my 
favorite thing in the entire show, which is that when they're preparing for the party and decorating, Michael puts giant red flags on the lawn. Differences of opinion you're gonna have, period. I'm exhausted. Hey, Tom. <laughs> like, I can't make this up. This literally happens in this show. Look at these flags out front. Perfect, just mwah, chef kisses, chef kisses. Italian chef, apparently. Unfortunately, this is not the only time that Jen is treated unfairly. Right at the end of the first season, Tal breaks an agreement he had with Jen by falling asleep in Michael and Kamala's bed after having sex. He had agreed that he would always sleep back with Jen after having sex if she was home. It means that I just, I want him to be home with me to sleep generally, not always, and that I ask him to honor that. So if I'm getting home from dance at one, I ask him to be home at one. And he blatantly breaks that. So I wake up and I'm like, hey, where's Tall? I just figured he'd gone to the bathroom. Oh, hey, Jen. Hi, Tall. What are you doing in here? Even worse, he lies about it. When he sneaks into Kamala and Michael's bedroom to have sex, Kamala makes a point to ask him if Jen is out with anybody else, which Tall says yes. Mm -hmm. You wanna join us? Mm -hmm. Where's Jen? Is she out with another lover? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But Jen is actually asleep in their bedroom. Like, he looks at her specifically right before he leaves, so he knows that's where she is. Did he tell you that I was out with my other lover? That's the understanding I had. I wouldn't have slept with him if I thought you were alone. In the yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm just trying to find out if Tal actually lied to you and well, told you I was somewhere that I, I wasn't. Didn't lie. I, don't, I don't know if I gave an answer. Five minutes earlier. Where's Jen? Is she out with another lover? Mm -hmm. Ergo. He is a liar. So the next morning when Jen finds out and Kamala tells her about what he said, it becomes a really big deal. Except for some reason, the focus very quickly goes from the fact that Tall blatantly lied and was dishonest with everybody, creating the problem in the first place, and onto Jen for being upset, I guess? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, this is an agreement that I love myself, and it certainly isn't one that I would agree to. I like sleeping with my partners, and I definitely wouldn't agree to only sleep with somebody that I cohabitated with, because that just feels very limiting to me, personally. But Tall did agree to this, and Michael and Kamala knew about this agreement as well. Kamala literally asked Tall where Jen was so they could make sure whether or not it was okay for Tall to spend the night with them. And Tall lied blatantly to their faces. Like, why aren't they more upset with him? Sorry. I know. I'm actually gonna go a little bit of a side rant here um, because this is something that just drives me up a wall and this show is like giving me an opportunity to rant about it. But I find it very frustrating when people have agreements and one of the people in that agreement will act like the agreement is being like kind of forced upon them. You know what I mean? Because like, if you agree to do something like, you you made that agreement too. Do you get what I'm trying to say here? <laughs> I see this a lot actually, um, in particular, where people, usually straight men, but, but not always, um, will have these like agreements and these very strict rules and structures to their relationships, and they'll make it seem like they, they kind of like got strong-armed into it and like complain about it without actually changing the agreement, you know? They'll be like, oh, you know, I, I really wish I could spend the night with you, but my wife won't let me. Actually, quite a bit in the allegations concerning Franklin Vo. For example, you know, he told Rose that he couldn't date them because of Eve's jealousy, which in itself wasn't true, Eve wasn't jealous, but that's, you know, a whole thing. Um, but he also made the choice to stop dating Rose, you know, like he could have said no, he could have said, I'm gonna keep seeing them no matter what, um, but he didn't do that. And then he didn't have like the strength of character to at least like own that responsibility of himself. Like it was somebody else's fault. Like he always like outsources the blame for some reason. But Franklin Foe refusing to take accountability for him is a, uh, is kind of like a whole larger pattern. And you can see that in my video that I talked more about right there. The card should be up here. <laughs> Getting back to the show, this is why I really don't like Tall because Tall continually blames and like gets angry and frustrated with Jen for these agreements he claims to not like but he also is agreeing to them and then making her not trust him by breaking said agreements. A broken agreement can sometimes lead to a conversation about why that agreement really isn't working for the people involved or even serving that relationship. 
but this isn't the way to go about it. That's a bit like cheating on your wife and then proposing non-monogamy to fix the problem. Kamala completely refuses to leave Jen alone about it too. When I was angry, but Tal said some pretty like shitty things. Him lying is a big deal to me. And it's just making me reconsider living here. I get it, you're hurt, but to, to say you don't want to live here, it feels like you're just running away because you're in pain. Jen asks for space and the quad doesn't give it to her. I don't want to talk to you. Really? You need to like admit to lying, Tal, before I even continue this conversation. Well, this conversation. It's over for now. No. And actually leave me alone. We, we need to figure this out. Now again, reality TV show, maybe some of this was edited so it actually was like, seemed like less time than there actually was between these moments. You know, I get it, limited amount of time, yada yada. Still, I really think it shows the true colors that these so-called, you know, highly involved polyamorous so-called experts that someone makes it clear what they need and then they are told why that doesn't work for other people. Sadly, not the only time in this show either. Michael and I have a total inclusion. Everyone we're playing with has always been, I'm included. And for you to say you're not comfortable doing a three-way with me is like saying you're excluding me and I'm not okay with that. In fact, Kamala makes the decision that they just can't leave the house in a state of tension and forces Jen, Tall, and Michael to come with them to perform this commitment ceremony for the season one triad. Like, honestly, I just feel so angry. I, I have no desire to go do that. Like, I have no desire to be stuck in a car with you guys. I can't leave with the household like this. You have to either come with me or I don't go. It's a really important thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. This leads to perhaps the most uncomfortable car ride I have ever seen on television. I can't, I can't look away. This is terrible. And the conclusion of it is that they just keep trying to get Jen to have the conversation. She doesn't want to. And then she sees the triad get married. And that's like so moving that she agrees to do the thing that Tal wanted to do. Now, in fairness, Jen isn't like a sweet, innocent angel either. In season two, she starts dating a much younger man. He's a lot younger than I am, which is hot. Which, look, I just don't think large age gaps are okay when one person is like in their 20s and the other person is like in their late 30s, 40s, or beyond. Like, I, I just don't, I, I know that some people disagree with me about that. You're allowed to feel that way, but that's just how I feel, okay? Like, just let, let the frontal cortex completely develop and then date them. That's all I'm saying. On top of that, some of the agreements that she and Jesse have are the kind of things that I do think are inherently toxic. For example, um, Jesse and her have an agreement that other than Tal and him, she will not have relationships with any other men. Everyone else has to be a woman. I talked about this a little bit in my unicorn hunting video about why when penis policies or OPPs are um, a bit like homophobic and, and problematic. But like really quick here, there's kind of this like homophobic belief that like if two women have a relationship, like not only is that, you know, hot and sexy, uh, but also it's not like as threatening as a relationship with a man is. Also, these policies are usually at least a shade or two transphobic because what counts as a quote, real man tends to come down to whether or not somebody was born with a penis. So even though trans women are women, they are usually excluded from these kind of policies because of them having had a penis at some time, even if they don't have one anymore. Again, Jen agreed to this, so she does bear some of the responsibility for this policy as well. Like, I'm not gonna just put that on Jetsy. Also, in season two, it is just so abundantly clear that Jen just straight up hates Tall now. Like, it is barely contained contempt at this point. I'm sorry your boyfriend is such a turd. <laughs> and, um, and whatever. Oh, I'm not ready for you yet, Tal. I'm just hugging your girlfriend. I really like Sephora. And sometimes I like Tal. Can you believe these two are divorced now? Because I can. Do 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 do. So let's talk about the season one triad a bit more. I mentioned before that a major plot point. Wait, can I refer to developments on a reality TV show as plot points? I don't. I don't know, that's what I'm gonna use though. <laughs> Complain in the comments below. Of the season one triad is that Lindsay develops a relationship with a man named Kristoff. This seems to piss off both of her partners, but especially Vanessa. Vanessa gets so mad at the idea of Lindsay being into someone who isn't her that it just gets really uncomfortable really fast. I feel hurt and left out of this because 
you are doing things with him and for him and around him that you don't do and never did with me. Lindsay and Kristoff are clearly in the early stages of the relationship, experiencing a lot of NRE, new relationship energy, or the honeymoon phase. And so when they're separated, Lindsay reaches out, says she misses him. You know, like most people would. And Vanessa hates this. I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. And it's just like, off like miss me you ass there's a lot of language in here that i really don't like and it honestly just makes me so happy that i'm a solo polyamorous like the triad talks about how Lindsay supposedly kind of sprung this on them but like that's not really explained what that means like at what point do you tell your existing partners about a new relationship like that's kind of a big question that everyone has to sort of decide for themselves some people might only really talk about a new person until it's a more serious relationship that has developed as opposed to maybe just like a few casual dates, which it seems is like what Lindsay did. She developed a serious relationship with Kristoff, the boyfriend over there. This is the first time that Lindsay's had this intense kind of boyfriendy, girlfriendy, mutual infatuation. Personally, I don't tell every partner about every date. I don't hide it, mind you. I just don't always see the need to discuss it. Like sometimes a date is just a date and there really isn't anything to discuss. At one point, Vanessa and Anthony basically tell Lindsay that she needs to focus on their relationship together and to not spend so much time with Kristoff, making it very clear that they want her to, you know, break up with him. So Lindsay goes to talk to Kristoff about what's happening and what they need to do and is actually interrupted by her partners just like barging into the conversation. <laughs> Hi. Look, the whole family's here. <laughs> can you believe these people are broken up now? Because I can. <laughs> just the shit-eating little grins that they have on as they walk in on this private moment alone would be enough for me personally in that situation to break up with them immediately. My cat just jumped into a box. Things might get noisy in a second. You better behave yourself or you're going in the bedroom. Can you behave yourself a little bit? They literally don't trust her enough to end her relationship with Kristoff. The reason we're here is we don't trust you to explain it by yourself. Which, this is a hot take coming in here, but if you don't trust a person you are in a romantic relationship with, you should probably end that relationship. So like, they show up, they bust open this conversation, they talk some like really weird, awkward smack talk, and then they have the audacity to pretend to be so gracious and generous as to like give them a moment alone to have this chance to say goodbye to each other. As a gesture, good faith towards you, we're gonna go home. Finish your time, you know, like have some time together. I know I said I was gonna try and be nice to everybody here, but to Anthony and Vanessa, fuck you. <laughs> Second half of the season builds to Vanessa proposing to Lindsay and Anthony and then their eventual commitment ceremony. And like the whole time I'm watching it, I'm just like, why should I cheer for you? Why should I want this? You're so controlling, Vanessa. Like, it was really hard for me to be happy for them when, like, just a few episodes before their commitment ceremony, Vanessa's, like, calling Lindsay a coward and forcing her to break up with a man that she loves. Lindsay deserved better. I hope she got it. Now, this triad has broken up, as far as I'm aware. Anthony lives in Italy now and apparently is in a new triad with two different women. Lindsay and Vanessa might still be together. Like, it kind of depends on who you're talking to. I know according to Anthony, he last heard they were still together, but then I saw another report that said that they weren't. Anyway, it does seem that Lindsay has since changed her name and a lot of her social media is like on private now, which to me, that's a very clear sign that she just wants to be left alone. So like, I didn't really feel like digging in any deeper. So, you know, personally, I hope they broke up, but I don't know, Maybe it, it was 10 years ago. Who knows what has happened? Boo, boo. Look at sexy polyamorous people making out. Let's stop talking about the drama of the show for a second, and let's just take a moment to acknowledge that there is um, a serious lack of body diversity on this show. Everyone on the show is thin, conventionally attractive, and white or white passing. I don't know the ethnic breakdown of everyone on the show, to be honest with you, and for the most part, there aren't many explicit conversations about race in the show. The one exception being when Tall and Lindsay find out that they're both Jewish and are sort of like, you know, uh, commiserating about that. I thought I read somewhere that Kamala is of Spanish descent in some way, um, but I can't seem to find that source now, so I'm not, I can't really confirm this. I do know there's an Instagram post where they were like visiting Spain and mentioned something about speaking in their mother tongue. 
And then there was um, some other Instagram posts, though, where they were talking about having, like, Russian ancestry. So, like, they might potentially be a mixed-race person. I'm, I'm not completely certain about that. Certainly, they are a very white-passing person. So, you know, that's just something to be aware of. Megan in season two is the only person who I know for certain isn't white. She is Asian American, I believe of Filipino descent based on just again some Instagram posts that I saw. Speaking of Instagram, hers is really good. She's got some like fantastic looks I, I must respect. Everyone's fairly young, not most of them not even close to middle age with the major exception being Chris at 45, but like I know on the internet 45 is old, but like in real life 45 really isn't that old. And he's also a former fighter and very fit. Until the second season, queerness is solely represented by women or AFAB individuals on the show. I don't want to diminish the importance of seeing women in relationships with other women or non-binary people being represented in media, but I think it's a bit telling that until Tall came out as bisexual in season two, gay or queer men or AMAB individuals were just like completely missing from this show. Male gays, more like, where are my male gays, am I right? <laughs> Was that a good one, Tantrum? That wasn't a good one. Some of the people on the show also have these jobs. I kind of feel like they were chosen maybe because it makes them even like more consumable for viewers. For example, in the first season, Vanessa works as a stripper and there's like a whole scene where they go visit her at her job. In season two, Leanne has her own pole dancing studio and we see her teaching classes and things like that. And Kamala is a therapist. I wanna make it clear, none of these jobs should be judged. Like I'm not saying this makes them bad or anything. I, these are all legitimate careers and I'm not judging anybody for them. I'm just pointing out that there are plenty of polyamorous people who have jobs like driver ed teacher or secretary or deli worker. Make real good sandwiches too. And sure, maybe not everybody wants to watch a show with an adorkable fat protagonist who's polyamorous, living in Southern Maine, making sandwiches for people and scream singing Roxette at their cats every Friday night, but. I mean, I would. <laughs> Basically, I just wanted to point out that on Polyamory Shark Week, everybody is thin, white, conventionally attractive, able bodied certainly as far as we are aware, and very financially well off. Polyamorous people come in many shapes and classes and races. There were many who felt like they were not represented by the show, and honestly, I'm one of them. But you didn't come here for any of this. You came for the drama, didn't you? Didn't you, little freak? little sicko, you nasty little pervert, you're gross and disgusting, I love you. Doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. The season two's big thing, as I mentioned earlier, is Leanne being worried about her relationship with Chris, her husband, and spending more time away from home. And then it turning out that on some of these business trips, she was actually also spending time with another man. A man whose name also happens to be Chris. Who's he? His name is Chris. <laughs> I know. Couldn't have at least been a Christopher, Leanne. Chris and Megan are understandably hurt by this, and Chris demands that Leanne leave the house for a time. Leanne ends up staying at a friend's place and basically spends the rest of the season trying to convince Chris, and mostly just Chris, to not only take her back, but then to like meet the other Chris, who is mostly referred to as Chicago Chris. This whole thing honestly becomes so frustrating so quickly for me because Leanne's way of dealing with the situation is mostly to just like lie and make people do what she wants them to anyway. Like she's apologetic, but she's also like trying to have her cake and eat it too. At one point, Leanne actually invites Chicago Chris to come and visit her for a time. However, unbeknownst to him, Leanne has also had a conversation with her husband about moving forward. And he makes it very clear that the only way that they can move forward is for her to like break up with Chicago Chris and that he also has like zero interest in ever meeting him. They think that I would like to work this out, but at the same time, I just have to be clear. The relationship that you've started now is not acceptable to me. The first thing that I need to happen if we're gonna come back together at all is you need to end that relationship. So Leanne fails not only to like actually adhere to her husband's very clearly stated boundary, but then like gets a man to play for a plane ticket without telling him that his visit is not gonna get to be as long as he was hoping for. She lies, she, 
if you'll allow me, talls. Leanne even admits to letting Chicago Chris come visit her under false pretenses because she wants to feel good. It's probably not a very good idea for him to come, but I'm lonely and I need comfort and love is the whole reason why I needed him in the first place. Leanne, you cheated on your partners. You're supposed to feel bad, like lean into a girl. I guess I shouldn't really be surprised by this. It is highly implied, though not necessarily outright stated in the show, that Leanne was also being dishonest with Chicago Chris about like what her situation was or what was even happening. I mean, I guess I just didn't realize how coy you were being in your real life as opposed to your like talking to me. I didn't, yeah. now, that I, now that I know that I was entirely hidden behind, I kind of get why they're so mad. You never wore a ring, you never talked about anybody, but you seem way too, you know, Awesome put together to be just like floating around as randomly as you were leading me to believe. I wasn't honest and I wasn't real with him. And so I didn't give him the chance to be as noble as he could have been. He's never ever tried to manipulate me. He's never tried to No one manipulates you, Leanne. You manipulate everyone else. Well, she also ends up like badgering husband Chris and Megan uh, with all these texts, basically trying to convince them to like come and meet her and Chicago Chris, even though they've already made it very clear that they don't want to. Leanne seems to be operating under some kind of false delusion that like, if everyone just meets, things will just happen to work out somehow. And she can just keep doing what she was doing without facing any real consequences. I've been texting Chris and Megan and asking them if they will meet my boyfriend. I really hope that if they meet him, that there can be some sort of compromise. Look. I can see that you're mad that you found out that I've been robbing you. I'm gonna tell you what, I'm gonna keep robbing you, but now you know about it. I think this is just what billionaires say to the workforce is. The meeting goes about as well as it could. Mr. Megan, right? I'm sorry, I'm not. Nobody's shaking your hand right now, dude. I have decided that I'm gonna try. And I've we all make that mistakes. I'm gonna try too. And you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I really don't know where where or if or what our relationship looks like. Ending with Leanne agreeing to break up with Chicago Chris. Is it possible for you to have a boyfriend at some point? That's a possibility. Do I think that I could ever be Chris? I don't. You understand that you will never ever be her boyfriend again. And Megan asking that she and Leanne can have some kind of like conversation before things continue forward between Leanne and Chris, husband Chris. Leanne isn't super thrilled with this, but ends up going along with it anyway. Of all the people in this scenario, honestly, the one I feel the most for is Chicago Chris. Like he gets f***ed over big time. Between husband Chris's misplaced anger at him and Leanne's lies, I just feel like this guy got a raw deal. I've always been so afraid of using him, you know, to make myself feel better and then throwing him away later. Hashtag justice for Chicago Chris. The rest of the triad storyline involves Chris and Leanne reconnecting and lots of discussion about whether or not Megan and Leanne can ever move forward with their own relationship. It's not outright said that if Megan decides to not date Leanne, that like she has to then break up with Chris, which would be an option polyamory, by the way, parallel poly is a thing, but like it is made pretty explicitly clear that like that's the implication. It doesn't work for me. I, I can't be in love with two women who no longer have a connection. The thing that really sticks out to me about this whole sort of like storyline or whatever, along with just the fact that Leanne is just a terrible partner through and through, is that I think there's a lot of um, demonstration here about the way that like implied hierarchy can make navigating non-monogamous relationships really difficult. I've talked about this idea a bit in videos before, like this idea that there's this sort of implied structure and path relationships are supposed to go down, especially if they're romantic. And like one of the biggest aspects of it is like centering your soul partner above like anything else. I think this is actually a big reason why some people think that polyamory wouldn't work for them or could ever work because if your partner is supposed to be your everything, how could you have another everything? Two everythings? Wow. <gasps> somebody is getting a little greedy. Your partner, joy friend, spouse, whatever, they're the person that you're supposed to go to every event with, tackle every challenge with, to being your primary, if not maybe your only source of emotional support. When married couples like agree to open up their relationships, it's very common to see them have these like rules and agreements that are very much structured in such a way to like protect at all costs these like initial coupling. So solo polyam people, relationship anarchists, and or those who pursue non-monogamous relationships without a primary can often be the ones screwed over. Have our plans canceled on last minute with little explanation or apology. Our schedules deemed not as important ultimately since we don't have a ring on our finger. And we're often expected to just put up with it. Because.
It is incredible how often pushing these couples to really explore why they have to date people together or why you might want to occasionally treat a secondary partner as equally important just breaks their little brains. Like they cannot conceive of it. Saying all of this because I think Leanne's real issue is that she just does not want Megan to be on equal footing with her at all. My big hang up is that Megan wants to be equal. And that's really where I have a problem. And finds it just unthinkable that Chris wouldn't just automatically choose her over Megan. Hell, she even says it. When Chris says that it's his worst nightmare, having to choose between me and Megan, it's pretty much my worst nightmare that he doesn't say it's an easy choice. But like, Chris has been dating Megan for three years, you know? They have a life together. They live together. He's supposed to just drop her like a sack of potatoes when his cheating, lying wife tells him to? I gotta tell you. Can I cut her out of my life now? Now that you're coming around and saying, you know, you don't know that you can really share? I don't know that I can. I mean, she told you that, you know, she wants to have, you know, an important place in our family. She's earned it. I know this review is mostly kind of silly and it's mostly meant to be kind of funny. And I'm sure many of you are giggling at the thought of me like powering through this toxic piece of trash. But like, I do want to get really serious here for a second. It is incredibly harmful to treat people as disposable. I know people who have been hurt by unicorn hunters, hierarchical couples with strict rules, by the assumption that, of course, you would never allow a girlfriend you acquire later, like a puppy during a pandemic, to have full autonomy and control over her own f relationship. People can't, nor should they be treated as a little hobby that you can just pick up when you are lonely or horny or bored and then drop the second that you're ready to return it. Like a puppy during a pandemic. When I was watching this with my friend Honey, she described Leanne as disgusting. I don't think that word goes far enough. I think this is monogamous-centered entitlement at its most toxic. Leanne really thought that she could lie, cheat, manipulated, and all of that would be accepted as okay by your husband and he would stick through it, it no matter what. Because for some people, love is never about having to say you're sorry or face the consequences of your actions. And I think that's up. I will never date a person who tells me that the shelf life of our relationship is contingent on the whims of some person who isn't even in that relationship. I also do not date people who insist I date their partners. And I deserve to be treated as a priority. Just because I don't have a ring on my finger and will probably never be someone's wife, I still deserve respect and autonomy because I am a person and I matter. Oh, and fun spoiler, Chris and Megan, they're still together. Leanne is long gone. And good f***ing riddance. Do -do, do -do -do, do -do -do. Ba -da -da. Okay, we got a little serious in that last part. Maybe there's something someone could say that could just like instantly lighten up the mood a bit? Like, who are you talking about? I'm the queen of Polly. Ah, oh, thanks for that assist, Kamala. I really appreciate that. Kamala is interesting because of the cast. They're the one that seems to be like the most strongest internet presence of the bunch and also the one who seems to be talking about the show the most to this day. Almost everyone else on the show either has their social media private, you know, some of them have changed their names or have basically moved on to other things um, unless like they're in that actual quad. Some of them don't even seem to be polyamorous anymore. Kamala has a website uh, talking about their various books and workshops and all of their tantric sex ideas in addition to their personal style of non-monogamy. They are really into sex as like a spiritual practice and you know, that's not my thing. I don't want to focus on that too much because like I don't want to be cruel and you know, if that's something you're into, ultimately it's probably harmless. So like, I don't know, I don't want to focus on it too much, but like Kamala did appear in a documentary called Sex Magic and their website has images like this. Cultural appropriation is defined by the dictionary app. I haven't read the majority of the blogs or watched uh, most of their videos outside of those that are like related specifically to the show, mostly because there's like literally hundreds of them. So like I didn't have enough time to do that. And honestly, also because I didn't really want to. Kamala and I are very different people with very different practices surrounding our non-monogamy and mostly that's okay, but like, I don't know, they just got some vibes around them, particularly like during the show, that makes me a little 
concerned about them being like an authority figure in polyamorous spaces. Who better to learn about relationships from than somebody who's doing like 12 relationships? No, no, that's not how that works. That's like me saying I'm qualified to run a restaurant because I get takeout all the time. They regularly argue people out of boundaries, makes excuses for why when they screw up it's totally okay actually, and also show an almost desperate need to be like the center and leader of the quad at all times. Hence why I view this quad as being so hierarchical. Kamala is the primary of the quad and the show. In season one, Kamala, who is all about everything being shared and everything's open and blah blah blah, has a girlfriend that they have been sort of keeping a bit separate from the rest of the group. And this is weirdly like a huge source of tension between them and their husband Michael. I'm just not ready to, to share her yet. And I know Michael's not happy about it, but that's my boundary right now. Basically we have the rule that we're not allowed to see her. And so for me, you know, that sounds like not a poly relationship. And like right out the bat, all of this is just a little weird, right? Like, why does Kamala have to share Roxanne? Roxanne is a person, not a bottle of water in the desert. Also, can we just talk about how shitty it is to like call one of your girlfriends, your quote, favorite girlfriend on television, which all of your other partners are going to see. Roxanne's my favorite girlfriend. Like f you, Jen, I guess. And really important question, how does Roxanne feel about this? Michael acts like the only reason that he and Roxanne aren't already bumping uglies is because Kamala is playing keep away with her. But like that completely ignores Roxanne's own autonomy. In fact, I would argue that there is plenty of evidence to show that Roxanne is not interested in Michael at all. It becomes very clear that Michael is interested in Roxanne sexually. And there's actually a moment in the show where Kamala like kind of presents Roxanne as now being available for Michael to at least hang out with. But Roxanne shows like no interest back. I mean, certainly not that I saw on screen anyway. When Kamala finally asks Roxanne if she would be open to spending some time with Michael, Roxanne makes it pretty clear that she has no interest in Michael sexually or romantically, but would be okay with the idea of them maybe, you know, developing a friendship of sorts. Well, I don't want to lead him on into well, thinking like we're on a date. I'd like to go on a, like a friendship. Like, you know, you get to know somebody first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, don't get me wrong, Michael's hot. He's funny, he's all these amazing qualities, but I don't have that chemistry with him that I have with you. Yeah. Like, I'm not holding anything back. Yeah, Michael seems to now think he has, like, the go-ahead to potentially date and or have sex with Roxanne. So the type of date that I was allowed to go on with Roxanne was a tea and chat. I'm pretty excited about the date with Roxanne. Roxanne's a beautiful woman. I'd love to make love with her. The meetup, which Michael won't stop calling a date, goes, you know, fine enough for the most part. They have what seems to be relatively friendly conversation. Certainly Roxanne comes off as a very like friendly, outgoing kind of person. And yet Michael seems to be thinking that Roxanne is like really vibing with him. During the potluck episode, there's actually a moment where he goes to like give Roxanne a bit of a kiss. And it's clear that she was sort of expecting more of like a friendly peck, but he goes for something like more like a French kiss or whatever. Um, we're talking French kissing. It's kind of fitting that this all happens in the same episode where Kamala initially is like bragging about like safe consent and all that, but then immediately admits that they sometimes forget to ask people before just hugging them. When a new person comes to our party, we actually like to ask, can I hug you first so that they have choice? But I suppose I probably just threw myself around them. <laughs> they were really attractive, so why not? Which, which means you're bad at, you're bad at consent then. That's what that, like you can't say you're good at consent and then admit that you don't ask. Like, I feel like I'm going mad over here. Michael misreading other people's interest in him is actually kind of like a running thing in the show, like purposefully or not a gag, but I kept laughing at it anyway. Like there's this moment in season one where Jen hangs out with her monogamous sister and Michael insists that the sister's like always flirting with him. Hey, hey Michelle. Michael. Jen's sister Michelle is very hot and she flirts with me all the time, um, but she's monogamous, which does seem a little bit hypocritical to me. I mean, this is the same sister who later on also admits that she literally finds non-monogamy gross, but like, yeah, Michael, she was totally riding your jock hard when she politely greeted you at the door. This man even talks creepily about the sea. I really look at surfing as one of my lovers, really. Right up there with Kamala, not quite. But close. Michael, I'm gonna take away the word lover from you for a while, buddy. All right, we're gonna put it on the shelf. You can have it back later, but you're overdoing it, okay? You know I'm right. 
I know I'm harping really hard on Michael here, but like I just really don't like men who assume a woman being even like remotely polite to him wants to f him. Like I, that's a man I literally do not want to ever be alone in a room with. Like that, that's legitimately terrifying. I actually got a little sidetracked. This was supposed to be about Kamala. There's a moment in the potluck episode where we really see how much Kamala hates not being an authority 24 seven. Like they start to lead the discussion and the new triad who for them, this is like the first time they've ever hung out with non-monogamous people. So like they don't even know all the terminology yet, right? Um, are asking some like pretty reasonable questions and Kamala gets pissed. Typically when we do the opening circle, there's no crosstalk. Since they're new, they didn't really get the etiquette. That might've been considered rude. Lindsay, you had one more question? Look at them. They're so mad. I love it. I'm a terrible person. I was watching this with my friend Honey. We both kept laughing about this because like we actually we used to host a, a semi-monthly polyamorous uh, discussion group thing that sometimes kind of became a potluck because, you know, people bring food, whatever. And um, we just couldn't imagine running an event in this manner, like rude for asking questions and wanting to talk. But this is the way Kamala is. They are meant to lead the discussion and to be the authority 24 seven. And anytime something threatens that, Kamala just does not react well. There's this one episode where Michael is accusing them of acting monogamous and Kamala does not react well. When Michael said that I was acting monogamous, I was like, who are you talking about? I'm the queen of Polly. And this is just like a thing that they said with a straight face. Don't get me wrong, it's probably my second favorite moment in this entire show. Look at these flags out front. But still, Kamala is like a bit less cringy in season two, but that may just be because there's so much other drama going on that their stuff by comparison seems rather tame. And also, frankly, the focus in season two when it comes to the quad is mostly about like Jesse and Jen's relationship as well as like Michael's relationship that he's developing with a woman named Rachel. Oh, uh, actually, this is a really good time for us to pivot for a moment and talk about Rachel, AKA my favorite person on this show. Do -do, do -do -do. Do, do, do. Ba -da -da. Okay, so in theory, I played a clip of Rachel earlier in this review. She's the one that told Kamala that she didn't want to be s with Kamala at a negotiation for an orgy, which Kamala's response to was, Michael and I have a total inclusion. Everyone we're playing with has always been, I'm included. And for you to say you're not comfortable doing a three-way with me is like saying you're excluding me, and I'm not okay with that. This is not how scene negotiation works, by the way. Anyway, as a bit more background, Rachel is definitely like one of the few people on this show that I actually do like. She did have the bad taste to get involved with Michael, but I mean, you know, nobody's perfect and who doesn't have that like one ex they look back on and is now very embarrassed by. Sadly, she's kind of a little bit more of like a side person in the show. So like they never bothered to do any of those like sit down interviews with her like they do with the main cast. So it kind of leaves, you know, the audience and myself to have to sort of speculate about how she feels about everything, which I actually think is too bad because I personally would have liked to have spent more time and to have understood Rachel more, but you know, that's, that's me. One thing that um, wasn't actually in my script that I forgot to mention is that Rachel is kind of interesting because she was actually a fan of the show in the first season and then sometime between seasons one and two she met the the quad and that's how she and Michael got together. So somewhere in here is a whole conversation about like <sighs> How do I talk about this without it having been scripted? Um, there's a whole thing here about like power dynamics and how like if you have like a certain like celebrity in polyamorous spaces, like that does create a power imbalance. And you know, that's a little concerning that Michael maybe didn't think like, hey, maybe I shouldn't get involved with a fan of the show. In fact, this is actually something that I credit Jen for really heavily in season two is that she actually initially expressed that she was a little concerned about Rachel and didn't really wanna be too close to her. So like, I don't know, it's a whole thing that just doesn't really get explored that much within the show itself. And I'm not gonna talk about it more here right now, but like that is a whole big conversation and is very concerning. Um, so just something I wanted to acknowledge in a very messy way. Season two, Michael's main arc is essentially about him and Rachel deepening their relationship. Go deeper, go deeper, go deeper. Conflict very quickly becomes that their ideas about what deepening a relationship means 
is very different. To make it clear, you know, everyone can have different ideas of what like deepening a relationship means, but generally speaking, that tends to be code for like essentially being more like emotionally intimate with another person, like strengthening those emotional bonds, being more vulnerable, sharing more of yourself with the other person, etc. In traditional monogamy, deepening a relationship usually falls along certain amata-normative lines, you know, things like moving in together, getting married, having a baby, those kind of things. For others, this could mean going on a trip together, uh, getting a pet to raise together, introducing your partner to a special secret spot that you like to go to when you're like trying to relax or center yourself. For Michael, deepening a relationship means having a threesome with him and his spouse. I'm not even kidding. As I'm speaking with Kamala, I realized that going deeper with Rachel really could mean that we have a, a threesome with me and Kamala. Early in the season, Kamala kind of remarks that Michael tends to have like rather short relationships with women. Um, they don't tend to last very long, maybe only a few months, and tend to be very sexual in nature. It's pretty much like a pattern. Yeah, you you yeah. get close to, to women actually, but you don't you know, maintain those relationships and you know, make them long term. Through the years, it's been pretty hard to balance being primary partners with a man who loves to just have sex without having to build the relationship. I hope that you ask her to come over and connect with me. Would you want to play with her too? Much in the same way that season one Michael continually asserted that people like Roxanne or others definitely wanted to have sex with him, he, season two Michael just keeps asserting that the best way to deepen his relationship with Rachel is to have some kind of group sex without seeming to know or care that there are other options. To her immense credit, Rachel does actually push back on this. Is there any way that you want to go deeper with me alone or does everything that going deeper with me involve others? Um, you know, I still do have a wife and I have a child and... Um... But that doesn't answer my question. It kind of seems like if I don't grow into the pod and into your relationship with your wife that that really leaves us with not a lot. It would really be more like me, you know, like having a separate relationship with you. Yeah. Which... That's still Polly. Ah, a woman challenging Michael on his bullshit. <laughs> Beautiful. Now, I think, though, I obviously can't know for certain that Michael may be somebody who is a megasexual and or possibly a romantic, meaning he is someone who needs strong sexual bonds in order to develop a romantic relationship with someone, or else just like doesn't really feel romantic feelings at all, or very rarely. That is okay, like that's a very valid way to be, and if that's you, like that's totally fine. My issue is that Michael kind of presents this as like being the norm and the way that most, if not all, polyamorous people go about it. When Rachel asserts that there are ways to do polyamory that aren't about her being like involved sexually with the other members of the quad, he asserts that this is how he does it. And then it's just kind of left there. That's like, not, it, not it, Yeah, it is, but it's definitely not the way that I have my life set up, you know? I have... Maybe that's why you never go deeper with girls. Maybe, yeah. And again, editing is a thing. There could have been more to this conversation that we're just not privy to. But like this very much comes off as if Rachel is being told that she has to date Kamala or at least be open to group sex with them in order to date Michael. Which is weird because prior to this moment, there actually was an attempt to have a threesome and Kamala was the one that it wasn't working for. When Michael was connecting with Rachel, I got really clear that this is like really real for Michael. They are awesome together physically and I didn't know where I fit into that. It's hard for me to just jump from zero to 60 with her, um, and I was conflicted. So is Michael only willing to date people who are willing to have threesomes with his spouse, even if his spouse isn't into it? Because of so. Look at these flags out front. And after they have this conversation, that's when we get the whole orgy negotiation scene, which, uh, I mean, is just gross. I want to have a sister connection with Rachel. I would love to play with her, but if she doesn't want to play with me, she at least needs to know the rules of a play party is that my husband and I always include each other. Um, I honestly don't have anything really clever to add here. I just find that scene really gross. Um, I think it's kind of up that Kamala treated Rachel like that and said that, and then um, it's extra gross because they're a therapist and they definitely should know that's not how you respond to someone asserting a boundary. A couple of ground rules. So the first is everything's consensual. Like you're mm. only doing that which you're a hell yes to. Five minutes earlier. Uh, that was actually the one thing I told Michael I didn't really care to revisit. I don't really need to have a second time that that doesn't work out, that I'd like to explore some other people tonight. Michael and I have a total inclusion. Everyone we're playing with has always been, I'm included. And for you to say you're not comfortable doing a three-way with me is like saying you're excluding me, and I'm not okay with that. I really hope that they don't stand by this anymore. 
like when I was doing a little bit of research into like what happened to people after the show aired, I did find out that Michael, Rachel, and Kamala all actually did date together as a triad, but then apparently they all broke up and I think at least two of them have described it as being both messy and painful. Considering how little interest that we saw um, Rachel like demonstrating for Kamala at the end of season two, it seems like to me, in my opinion, based on what I'm seeing, caveat, 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 that Rachel was forced to date Kamala as a condition of being with Michael and then it didn't go well because it never does. Now, in fairness, it does sound like everyone's on good terms now and it looks like Rachel has moved on and has a like, beautiful family. So like, I don't want to like poke and prod an old wound too much. All I'll say is that uh, forcing somebody to date a partner of yours as a condition for being with you is literally never a good idea. Don't do it, especially when it's like really inorganic. It's just, it never goes well, I promise you. And a practice like that is, in my opinion, a huge... Look at these flags out front. I love that clip so much. I really do. Doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo, ba -da -da. I have been mainly, Mandy, <laughs> hey buddy, negative in this review. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that there were some moments on the show that I did actually like brief and fleeting though they were. As I previously mentioned, there were some moments on the show in which people started to engage sexually and then someone usually Jen, would need to take a pause and it was very much accepted by the group. As much as I want to get into this because Kamala put a whole bunch of effort into it and she was really trying to cheer me up, Jesse's on my mind. Oh, I love you. I love you too. And there were a few moments that I did find actually kind of hot. Like there's a moment where um, Vanessa, Anthony, and Lindsay, along with a few of their friends, are like all in a hotel room together and they're all just like, painting Vanessa. Did I just unlock a new kink? Well, I don't think I would ever date anybody on this show. I do have to admit that I did find one of Kamala's partners, Jason, very cute. I just, uh, I just love me a tall, long-haired himbo. I just, mm, that's beautiful. Although hopefully he's no longer reading the same blogs. Fun fact, the guy that writes that blog is a Franklin Bow apologist. Thought I would shut up about you, Alan. Guess again, fucker. <laughs> As much as I do dislike Vanessa, I actually do think she brings up some very good points about how being like the third partner to a married couple can have some very unique challenges. Probably the hardest thing for me about being in a triad with a married couple is that no matter what, I am always left out of things. They get invited to a wedding, it's a plus one. It's never a plus two. And you know, I have to fight every day to be recognized as a legitimate partner. I agree, that is actually really hard. There's also a moment where the season one triad are like talking about going to this potluck and someone brings up the really good point that it would be kind of weird to go to an event where the only thing you have in common with everybody is being monogamous. Just because this is a poly party doesn't mean that we're going to have a lot in common with these people. Think about how absurd it would be if, if every time I met a monogamous person I was like, hey, you know what, I have another monogamous friend, you guys would probably really get along. Sometimes being poly is the only thing we have in common. And I love this because honestly, it is true. You're like sometimes the only thing you have in common with non-monogamous people, much like with monogamous people, is literally just like your relationship style, right? For example, I have a very strong inkling that the person who uses phrases like soul tribe probably isn't somebody I have a lot of things in common with. And yet, polyamorous people seek out each other for support, community, resources. It's often a very necessary part of our survival. There's a moment while processing the cheating revelation where we see Chris like talking and processing with another man, a very fit man at that. And I actually really just find this whole scene really sweet. Like when this happened, I actually had this moment where I felt like I was being a little initially unfair to Chris. Like, yeah, I still don't love that there's like this huge age difference between him and Megan, but like seeing him talk about his feelings and just like being really vulnerable and open with another man especially is just really good. Like this is a really great model for other men who might be watching this show, you know, telling them and showing them that it's okay to be vulnerable and that men can support other men in healthy ways. This is actually one of the, the big reasons that beyond the, the age difference thing, this script doesn't really have that many criticisms of Chris specifically because by the end of the season I really saw in him this like example of a man who's really trying to learn and grow and handles his emotions in a much more mature healthy way. I do want to apologize for just throwing you out of the house like that but I didn't know what else to do. You know maybe it was easier for me to spend my time and attention with Megan and not give you the 
love and affection that you deserve. I'm willing to take accountability for not working harder to protect our marriage. He's not perfect at it. I have absolutely no interest in meeting this guy. If I did meet him, all I would do is put him through a wall. But he is trying, and I do actually appreciate that. The other thing for me, too, is that, you know, when Leanne finally is honest about the fact that she doesn't really want Megan to have as much, like, control and power and equality in the relationship, Chris doesn't just immediately adhere to that. He pushes back. He advocates for Megan and... I just really appreciate that. The bar is kind of low, sure, fine. The fact that he does the bare minimum here really shouldn't be noteworthy, but he does, and I do appreciate that. And, you know, for all of his bluster about, you know, threatening physical violence, which isn't great, uh, he never does it. We never see him punch a wall. He never yells. It's implied maybe he's had issues with temper in the past, but we don't see that in the show. He seems to be controlling himself pretty well. Maybe he was just doing it because cameras were on him. You know, it's certainly possible. But anyway, I don't know. What anger he does express seems very understandable considering the circumstances. So I don't know. I'm kind of on team husband Chris here. And again, he and Megan are still together, you know, years later. So, you know, even if their initial coupling is a bit problematic, they're still together. And it seems like they do generally really love and care about each other. So, you know, good for them. If they're watching, I I'm honestly really happy for you too. Michael and Kamala have a son together, and while his appearances in the show are actually very brief, it's kind of cool to show some people that who are polyamorous and also have children. Because polyamorous people are sometimes accused of just like not being child friendly just by way of being polyamorous. Hell, I actually recently had somebody who presumably is polyamorous in a polyamorous group saying that being public about your polyamorous lifestyle in front of children is essentially the same as grooming. I wonder why that sounds familiar. I do wish we actually got to see more of that because personally I think that's really interesting to think about like the way polyamorous families kind of navigate things and like some of the pros and cons that come with that. Like I know a couple of polyamorous families so like I just think that could have been a really interesting opportunity to explore that more. Like honestly I would have happily traded a few of those threesomes so I could have seen them all like handle a PTA meeting. But still it is actually really sweet to see all the coming outs being handled so well and you you know, as somebody who's my own family and friends were luckily very supportive of me coming out as polyamorous. Um, like, it's, it's just really nice to see other people get to experience that. In season two, Jen seems to have much stronger boundaries with the quad, which I personally really love. Like, there's a moment when the quad is discussing her relationship with Jesse, who they are basically all kind of accusing of being, like, too monogamous, and they, they're obviously not completely happy with him still being a little bit separate from the quad, and they're kind of complaining to Jen about this. And, you know, in fairness, I do have my problems with Jesse too. And like they're talking about how they want Jen to like better integrate him into the group. Uh, and Jen has just like the perfect answer for them. I would just like to see him more integrated into our group. I'd like that too, but it's really up to him. Yes, exactly. Jesse is his own person. He has autonomy. He gets to decide his like involvement level. Jen, I'm so proud of you. Do 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 do. Okay, so fun fact. Um, I wrote a really bad conclusion and I started to write a longer conclusion and then apparently I forgot to finish the conclusion so I'm just gonna wing the end of this review right I don't really have a review system this show has I don't know we'll give it 10 out of 10 red flags look at these flags out front three out of 10 green ones just to be a little bit fair so I don't really know if there's many lessons that we can really learn from this show other than like don't do most of what you see, please. <laughs> like, I think it could be a good introductory for some people. Um, there's many, many, many things that are done that I have a lot of critiques of. And again, if I made a full review of every single thing I had an issue with or every like reaction that I had to a talking point, uh, this review would be like three hours long and we're not making a three hour video again for a very long time. I'm not mad this show exists, just to be clear, you know, like certainly there are worse ways the non-monogamy could have been handled. <laughs> I guess. And, you know, I understand that for some people, this show really did mean a lot for them, right? Like, at a time when non-monogamous representation is still extremely difficult to find, this is, like, one of the few, like, really big things that we have. And this was, like, a mainstream show. Like, this was on Showtime, right? So, like, this is the kind of thing that monogamous people got to see as well. I, I am happy the show ended on two seasons. I know some people are really mad it didn't have a third season. I'm personally fine. I don't know if my brain could have handled a third season of this ridiculousness, but you know, that's just me. 
Uh, and you know, it would be kind of interesting if in the future something like this came back, but maybe did a better job at like representing other kinds of polyamorous relationships, you know, like, I'm just saying if an executive from Showtime is watching this and you want to watch a, a solo polyamorous slash relationship anarchist living in Southern Maine, who is a deli worker, <laughs> live her life, you know, let, let me know, hit me up. I will happily be on that show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this review. Thank you so much to my patrons for supporting me over on patreon.com slash mainly Mandy. Um, I'm already past 50 supporters at this point. I think I'm at 60 at the moment. Um, so it means a lot to me to have gotten to this point. You know, I'm making more money off of this than I, I, I had previously. And um, that's definitely helping me out a lot, especially with like all the job change stuff that happened to me this year. Um, thank you for your patience and waiting for this review. My life has been ridiculous lately. Uh, in theory, there's going to be one more video out before the end of the year. I'm going to try and get that done. Um, filming today went by a lot faster than I thought. So I think I'm going to try and film it today um, after I take a little brief break to like maybe t take a, a, a eat. Take an eat. You heard me. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this. If you enjoyed, like the video, share it maybe, uh, comment down below. If you've watched the show, let me know about parts of the show that you really like. Tell me about the parts you don't like. Was there anything in particular I mentioned that you don't agree with? If so, let me know. Let's, let's have a conversation about the show. If you're somebody who worked on this show or was on the show, or maybe you're involved with any of these people and you wanna share some stories down below, I'd be happy to hear from it. Um, I heard that there was supposedly some places where people talked more in depth about things things on the show that weren't presented as, you know, real as they actually occurred. But when I tried to find those sources, I mostly just kept coming back to Kamala's blog and they didn't really get into details that I could find. Again, though, they've written a lot in the last decade as well as made so many videos, so it's possible I just missed something. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention. Um, I'm gonna be changing my Patreon tiers a little bit. I mentioned this to my, my patrons and they were all just like, yeah, whatever, we don't care. <laughs> They're just like the chillest people. Um, but I'm gonna be changing my my um, my structure a little bit so that basically what's gonna happen is some of my goal, some of my like benefits are gonna disappear, but everyone's gonna have the same access to all the benefits. You just get to choose how much money you wanna give me. Um, I'm hoping that this will help to encourage more people to join and then that way everything's like a little more even. Because if, if you couldn't tell, I really don't like hierarchy and it stresses me out when I'm trying to like remember who gets what benefit and then this way I can just, everything will be the same. Certain benefits will be deleted, like I will no longer be able to read people's names out loud because if I have to read everyone's names out loud, that's just gonna get messy very quickly. Let's not do that. And obviously I can't make everybody a bath bomb. So, you know, some things are gonna be deleted, but overall I'm hoping this kind of like evens things out right now just to make it a little easier for myself. And then also hopefully that makes it a, like a little more fair. Because in my opinion, if you give me $2 or you give me $50, you're both equally awesome to me. I don't like hierarchy. If you're thinking, been thinking about signing up over to patreon.com slash mainly Mandy, this is a good time to do it. And on the alternative side, if you would like to do more of a one-time donation, which is also very nice of you, I do have Coffee, Venmo, and PayPal. All of that information is, of course, available in the description box below. I'm getting hungry and thirsty, so I'm gonna wrap this up here. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. This video is brought to you by all of my Patreon supporters over on patreon.com slash mainly Mandy. A special thank you to Angela Ward, Adam Fellows, Austin Tallman, Bailey Grevlin, Beat Duck, Kaylin Conrad, David Lindes, Haley Williams, Jeffrey Reynolds, Kevin Cook, Liz Hammond, Michael Mirandis, Nana Nana Mouse, Faye Briscoe, Thea Westfall, Polly Amethyst, Sidekick, and of course, Veronica Duff.
to everythings in this economy? <laughs> I didn't write that part in the script, but it's going in now. <laughs>